Welcome to this core conversation about installation profiles slash distributions. Um, here are a couple of people which are involved in that. Um, and we will just try to like sum up the current state, give some people, uh, like, like show the different users and use cases and pain points and how to solve that. And we hope you all have like your own opinion and we should discuss stuff and help uh, each other to improve the situation. Uh, uh, so, okay, I guess. Uh, so, uh, hi, I'm Adam Venaproxima on D.O. I am uh, currently uh, maintaining the Lightning distribution for Acquia as well as the Migrate and Media subsystems in Core. Me next. Hi, my name is Christian. I'm uh, one of the Thunder distribution maintainers, um, and I'm already involved uh, in a lot of media stuff. Hi, I'm Ryan Azad. I. Uh I'm on the Drupal Association, uh, Drupal.org engineering team. Um, I manage packages.drupal.org and the test bots and uh, work with Neil Drum over there on uh, distribution packaging and things like that. Yeah, I'm Daniel Wiener. Um, I'm part of the Contenta install profile and like I'm uh, involved in all kinds of things. <laughs> True. Oh, next slide. <laughs> Uh, all right. I have a question for people. I just want to ask a quick show of hands. Um, how many people have used a distribution before, like to build a website completely? Oh, wow. Whoa. Okay. This is going to be a tough crowd, man. <laughs> um, okay, how many people, out of curiosity, uh, know the difference between an install profile and a distribution? Less people. All right. I guess we'll talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, okay, well. Um, yeah, do you want to cover yeah, this one? Yeah. Okay, yeah, what an install profile is, it's uh, basically, um, yeah, configuration coupled, uh, configuration with, um, and modules. So it's just like that, and um, everyone knows standard profile, so every Drupal installation has an install profile. So there's a, just a small difference between installation profiles and distribution, but installation profile is just a uh, yeah, list of modules and configuration. Yeah. And, to come to the and, uh, and the distribution is an installation profile plus the packaging aspect of, so how do you fetch the modules you have in your, your distribution? Um, most of them are on Jupyter.org. Yeah, distribution is like, I think of it as if the install profile is like a little module that says, oh, here's my laundry list of modules that I want to install, and here are some changes I want to make to the installer, if you're into that. Um, the distribution is that plus all of the actual modules that it wants, all, and also all the JavaScript libraries that it wants, bundled into a single tarball and distributed on Drupal.org. So that's, that's the difference. I hope that helps. Yeah. Uh yeah, here's just a list of distributions. The, the I, top seven distributions on Drupal.org. I, I might ask a couple questions because I know very little about distributions other than that we serve them. Um, <laughs> would you say that a distribution install profile that, uh, like a composer JSON file or a Drush make file that has a manifest of what you need downloaded is an install profile what you need installed in Drupal? Is that the difference? Like. The install profile to me, well, the, the install profile doesn't include a Drush make file or a composer JSON necessarily. But, so, I mean, they're both yeah. manifests, but one of them is in Drupal, one of them is just on your file system. Yeah, yeah. So the install profile includes a list of modules to install. Yeah. Because you can have more modules in your distribution that you're not enabling by default by installing yeah. the install profile. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. So. Yeah, that's what we also do at our Thunder distribution. We are uh, shipping a lot of um, modules and we're having a yeah, configuration page after the installation. Okay, um, we installed a lot of mo um, modules for you, but here are some others you might like or you might need. So, yeah. Um, yeah, what Thunder is, I don't know if everybody has heard of it. It's a distribution. Um, from Hubert Boda Media, and it's from, from a publisher um, of German uh, for publishers, and it's focused on yeah uh, easy creation, easy article creation. That's what we mainly did um, in the last two years. Uh, now we are going a bit wider and want to include landing pages or creation of landing pages and stuff like that. 
but yeah, we are, yeah. as I said, uh, distribution could also <coughs> chip a theme, so we introduced our own admin theme, and but we don't have any front end stuff, so just uh, what is it, Bartik theme. Yeah, that's so some introduction to Thunder. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so Lightning is another example of a distribution. Um, its intention was it was built to improve the experience, the, the back end authoring experience of Drupal. Um, and that was done by improving media functionality, improving layout, and improving uh, workflow. And we did this in various ways. Um, you know, with certain modules, panels IPE, uh, workbench moderation, and media entity, which are all now in varying degrees going into core. So I kind of look at Lightning as core plus plus. Um, and it also, as with Thunder, is not a lo it's not opinionated about styling. Um, it also it's Bardic out of the box seven in the back end, um, and that's that was its purpose, and that continues to be its purpose. It's just improve the, is improve life for authors. And. Uh... The final distribution we want to show is Contenta, which is um, a di um, API first distribution, which means that instead of like using trick templates and like uh, panels and all these kind of things to build your site, you have an API and then you have some kind of consumer which pulls the data in and then renders stuff. And we are uh, leveraging the out of the box initiative idea of. Um, a recipe magazine to provide an example content, but um, it's it's a full distribution in order to get you started. So that's the main difference between like Lightning and Thunder and Contenta is that Contenta is really just a starter kit, and um, in Thunder and Lightning you get like a continuous update path. Um, yeah. So this brings us to the less organized part of the slides. From here it gets a little bumpier, and we're, we definitely want to open it up. Um, for a conversation, if anybody wants to ask a question or whatever, or engage us in fearless debate, just head on up to the mic over there. Um, this is just a way of saying that uh, all of us, are, we as distribution builders have encountered a bunch of pain points that are pretty consistent um, when building distributions. And so one of the things we want to do is just tell you what those pain points are as distro builders, which can also affect you as distro users. Um, and hopefully come up with ideas about how to address these things, share some of the ideas we've had, um, and what Drupal.org can do to, uh, to help as well. So this is where we start bitching about core <laughs> for the rest of the day. <laughs> so uh, if you came yeah. here to do that, I hope, you, uh, I hope you're ready. Let's start with not bitching about core, but rather about uh, Drupal.org. <laughs> 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 so um, currently, right now, there is a problem on Drupal.org that Composer JSON for installation profiles aren't respected. Instead, you need to dr use Drush Make, which is a an old technology from yeah, I don't know five. And years it's gone in Drush Nine. There is no more Drush Make, so you pretty much have to be like if you're not using Composer now, you will eventually, and that's just a fact. So um, um, yeah, um, it's not just Composer. Uh, you need to uh, like. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, should we say anything? Well, this is the thing. <laughs> the, one of the problems right now in a distro, if you're packaging modules, like address module is a really good example of this. Media entity Twitter also suffers from this problem. Uh, simple OAuth as well uh, jumps to mind. These are all modules that have Composer JSON files because they depend on libraries that you get with Composer. So these are modules with Composer dependencies. And if your distro includes modules like this, um, the tarball that D.O. gives you is not going to have those composer dependencies, which means that at some point your code's going to blow up. Um, and that is a pretty big problem um, for us. So the way we worked around that in Lightning was pretty, pretty unfortunate, honestly. We had to like change our project page to just be like, please don't use the tarball, it's broken. Um, here, just run this command for installing the composer dependencies if you absolutely must, but just use composer create project um, to create a lightning project and then everything will be happy. Um, so this is really more of a Drupal.org problem, not so much of a lightning problem or a distro problem specifically. So uh, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, oh, hi. If, what can we do about we, this? Well, if you switch the slide, sorry. We're rearranging slides as we speak. Oh. Oh, did that not work? No, never mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm on like slide 19 now. 
<laughs> As I said, it gets disorganized from here. So, yeah. so um, I mean, it, none of the bullet points are really relevant. Really, like you said, brush make is going away. So um, that means that we need to be able to support building tarballs out of out of Composer, and once we have that on Drupal.org, then distributions will be able to stop using Drush Make and stop using that as the way to provide a manifest. And then it'll make it easier, of course, for the third party libraries to show up. Um, and yeah. then another problem that'll help us address is there's always been an issue with licensing on the tarballs that get put out in that we've always had to like have a white list of acceptable packages. Composer has a way built into it to allow us to check the licenses of the end result that we build with Composer, so we can check it against a licensed whitelist as opposed to an individual package whitelist, which will get us a lot farther down the road of making sure that whatever we want to distribute is going to follow the policies that we have on Drupal.org for licensing. Um, we will still need to figure out how to handle JavaScript dependencies and assets. Yeah, that's, so. that's been a persistent issue for a long time. The way it currently works on Drupal.org, um, if you're making a distribution, is there is an issue queue somewhere called the Drupal.org library packaging whitelist or something, and there's a bunch of fixed issues in that issue queue which say, please allow you know dropzone.js to be packaged in a distro in a tarball. And what you have to do is you have to submit like a link to their GitHub and a link to their license, and then somebody takes a look and if everything checks out, they add it to some whitelist somewhere. Um, and that whitelist then allows that particular library from particular, clone from particular URLs to be packaged in with a uh, distribution in that tarball. Um, which mostly works. Um, it's kind of a pain if your library is not listed because then you gotta file an issue and then you have to be on IRC and like poke people to get it uh, you know, approved. Or but, <laughs> or what? Or be an admin. Yeah. If you're an admin, none of this applies to you. So, so if you build your own distribution, better get involved on Drupal.org. <laughs> All right. And uh, it also be a problem when you don't have the correct license. We uh, had this issue uh, once when we wanted to integrate uh, AMP module, for example, and AMP module needs some library from GitHub, and this GitHub is this GitHub library uh, is not compatible with uh, GPL2 version. So, um, yeah, we got the issue back, so sorry, we cannot do it, and yeah. This yeah. broke our build, basically, so. Yeah, so it's like if the library that you want is not gonna be GPLv2 compatible and you wanna distribute that in a tarball on D.0, you're screwed, pretty much. Like, you're gonna have to basically put instructions on like, oh, by the way, download my library after you install my distro, which I guess you can do it, but it sounds kind of pathetic, and for non-technical people, that can be pretty intimidating. Um, the way I look at all this as a distro maintainer is that all of this goes away. I, I'm very in the camp of like, can we all just please use Composer now? Um, and I recognize that's not the most realistic camp in the world, but um, my, the way I look at it is like all of this goes away if Drupal.org stops shipping code, but the truth is that to get people to use distros, I think that we have to have a way to get them that's at least as easy as just downloading and, un, and uh, extracting a tarball. So, you know, um, if you're using Composer, one thing that makes the pain of the JavaScript libraries a little bit easier from a technical standpoint is there's this thing called Asset Packages. I don't know how many people have heard of that, but it's a packages repository that pulls in automatically every package on NPM and Bowers repositories and sort of uh, massages them into being Composer packages so that you ultimately can get JavaScript libraries in via Composer, um, which I think is pretty cool. Lightning uses it. Um, some people think it's weird. Um, you know, some people think that Yarn, Bower, NPM might be a better idea. And this, this is an open question. So this is one thing we'd love to hear from people on, if you have any ideas about, you know, ways that you would prefer to get JavaScript libraries into a distribution um, or into your site. You know, how would you rather bring them in? And, you know, that's the thing. We can kind of do, as Ryan's told me before, like we can kind of do anything on Drupal.org in terms of, you know, if we want, if people want to use Yarn, I mean, Drupal.org could be made to like run Yarn while building the tarball, but there's sort of a matter of consensus here and kind of right. And the consensus the is important because we don't want to have a packaging build process that runs 15 different tools to try and pull in all the different things. And I, th I mean, I think Drupal Core is moving towards Yarn as far as using that for testing and pulling in all the JavaScript dependencies for that. So. Uh, I mean, that's 
feeling the direction that things are going, but with JavaScript turned, you know, we may be using anchovy next week. So how many, how many are familiar with anchovy? I actually That's never good, heard of it until I... So there isn't, there's oh, you no really made it manager up. called anchovy, but... <laughs> <laughs> you got me. I'll do that right now. I'm actually curious about this. Oh, I thought it was a domain. Thinking a little bit outside the, the box, but um, what if we had, like, you could have an external, like, build pipeline, and then you could use Yarn and, you know, compile SAS and do whatever you want to do, and then just upload your own tarball, and then maybe it scans the tarball for licenses or something like that, rather than, because we're kind of heading towards having, like, a whole CI kind of build process on Dribble.org, and that's really hard for, you know, the be able to maintain and that kind of thing. So. I don't know as much of the, that's a really interesting idea yeah. that I think is really cool. I, I, can, I can see that potentially, I mean, I don't know like how, how you would look at this. I mean, it sounds like a potential security issue, um, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, we would be distributing code that uh, we potentially hadn't processed or looked at, but yeah. the, the, I think the main thing there is figuring out how we would resolve the licensing question of like, are you giving us stuff that we're legal to distribute? You know, like, or, it's kind of like Docker Hub images or something like that where you can push stuff up and maybe you can scan, you know, the, the tarball or something like that. So. Yeah. He has, yeah. like, a maybe naive question. Could, uh, like, if you are uh, able to, like, upload a tarball, could you also able to, like, just point it to an other, to, like, totally different URL on, like, GitHub or wherever you have your tarball? in case you have a licensing problem, then like the licensing problem wouldn't appear, but still there's like the central nice to discover place on Drupal.org. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's two kinds of licensing problems. There's ones where it violates our policy of what we're willing to distribute, and there's other ones where it's just not legal to distribute it that way. And so um, that's, you know, that it, we could run into issues where someone comes to Drupal.org and downloads something, and they've got a proprietary SDK bundled with GPL v2, and they're like, well, what did I get here? And is this legal for me to, to be distributed to me? And then they come back on us because of the money. But, you know, that's one of the issues. I can see with that. But. So do we have any distro builders in here except us? Maintainers. Oh, cool. All right. A Three, few. Four. Nice. So out of curiosity, backtracking a little bit, would you guys prefer to be able to just build distros with Composer? Or, you know, do you prefer? Okay, I'm getting a vigorous nod over there. Um, or does Drush make sound good? Looks like kind of consensus is composer. Okay, so I'm not crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at, at least for, for me personally, like just using whatever is the best practice in like the entire ecosystem is the right way to go. Especially also for JS dependencies in my point of view. Like using composer to download JS dependencies feels wrong. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a little weird. Yeah, it's a work of one. I, I used the asset uh, composer thing, and like we had huge performance issues with that really? in terms of like uh, like it was just super slow to fetch all the dependencies from npm. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know why. Maybe with we fetching the dependencies from npm or that, from well, asset package. Maybe we used a different package, <laughs> but there was a way to like basically fetch the dependencies from npm locally and then build composer <laughs> fake packages locally. But maybe that's a different um, yeah, way. I mean, I'll, I'll speaking only from experience using asset packages, yeah. it's you know not taken any more than the usual <laughs> 25 million minutes uh, when you know doing a composer update. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's talk about the the next pain point. Uh, right, so testing. yeah. Do you wanna? Yeah. We're testing. Ah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, for distributions, uh, there is currently no testing on Drupal.org. So yeah. um, what we as distribution maintainers have to do is we have to set up our complete own environment. So we are using uh, so we are using GitHub for development and then uh, Travis for testing our distribution. Same. Yeah. And then there are two approaches how to test the distribution. Um, we are using, for example, um, the normal Drupal test, so test beta, testing the integration of everything together with, um, yeah, mostly functional JavaScript tests, and um, but that could be really slow. So because before a, a JavaScript test run, you have to install the entire uh, distribution, which could be take some time, um, and because of that, we uh, uh, 
searched for our own solution. So we, before the installation, uh, the, the testing starts, we will dump um, the, the distribution and then reuse this dump for every um, JavaScript test. And that makes it a little bit uh, faster. The yeah. other approach is using Behead. I think uh, yeah. Lightning is using Behead. Yeah, I, I kind of now, like since he told me about the database dumps the other day, I'm kind of like, man, we should do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see, that's smart. I mean, <laughs> yeah. For every single, oh. Because it's a very latency project. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, you know, I float the ideas of BHAT as not, you know, the distro testing tool, but a pretty good one um, in many, for many cases. I think Lightning, between the two of us, I think Lightning's the only one that's really testing with BHAT. Um, most of our tests are BHAT. Some of, a couple of them are PHP unit, but those are like the tests. We don't really write web tests in PHP unit for precisely the reason you said, which is we don't want to wait. Um, I, you know, talking with these guys downstairs before this, um, you know, what I come to think is like, I think BHAT's a really good tool for testing in a distro because a distro is really intentional. They're usually built for specific use cases and specific kind of problem spaces, industry verticals. Um, and so for less technical people, the fact, just the fact that BHAT tests are written in, you know, whatever your native language is, is really, really fantastic because it's just native. It's a story. It makes sense. You can read it's like, and if this checks out, it's like this scenario that I as a non-technical person can understand, I know this works, I know my website will do that. So for distros, which are probably more, which may be more geared to um, people with more specialized needs that may not be, and they may not be quite as technical, um, it can be really, really helpful for that. The only problem is, of course, BHAT testing is really tricky, it's not contextual. Um, you know, if I say I click the save button, uh, well, which frickin' save button? If there's more than one on the page, I could be clicking the wrong button, and in a headless browser environment, I am absolutely gonna have no idea, and I'm gonna wonder why my tests are broken and my environment is polluted now, which is another problem, um, because BHAT tests will, are persistent. You know, normally, I mean, you're, you know, dumping and you're wiping and, like, you know, restoring with every scenario. We don't do that, um, so it means if something fails and, like, screws the environment up. Yeah, and, and I have done so much like terrible hacking in order to do exactly that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, BHAT's like, so it's useful for, useful for testing a lot of things. It's useful for like proving to, to non-technical people that your distribution works, that it fulfills their use case, um, can be trickier from a technical perspective. For, for me, BHAT is, is like this communication tool with like your users or client or whatever. But I think like BHAT is really not, well suited for like testing edge cases and like testing all the needy little bits of your distribution, maybe yeah. also like testing the update path, um, which is like a huge pain point. Like how do you like have a, how do you even know which possible state could be the user's side in you want to update in uh, to your next version of the distribution? Um, I don't know, it would be really great to like hear experience from other people. Do you do testing? Well, your update paths. So we, we use BHATS a lot, and we, we end up writing our own custom um, feature context to test anything, really. We don't like really crazy things, which uh, wouldn't be a hack if we didn't otherwise. But we, couldn't, we, we can do this with custom feature context. And we can write a custom BHAT extension as well to do that. And I think it's a, it's a good idea to use BHATS. And we talk about using uh, BHAT on Drupal.org on CI. Yes, that's uh, definitely something that we're looking at offering. Yeah. Um, it was it was sort of a you know it started with my first question is like what do you need tested in a distribution? What kinds of tests are you writing in a distribution? Because yeah. you want to replicate what cores already testing or the module. Oh, not really, because so. I think BHAT is a different type of test. It's not like right. um, because there's the um, the web tests, there's a PHP unit tests, like functional tests, 
and Bihar is a little bit different, but I think we could try to use Bihar to do things that we cannot do with um, in a simple test or unit test. Right. Um, I have a question. I, I think you already said earlier, but I just want to double check. Because we have a, a, a situation when we run in simple tests on Drupal CI, which is the dependencies, as we just spoke, um, the composer.json is not picking up dependencies. For example, um, I'm a maintainer of AMP, and we are trying to test the AMP theme, which is also added via composer.json, but that doesn't get picked up on Drupal CI. Um, hmm. Are we trying to look into some solution for that? Um, that that should work. I mean, that's probably a, open an issue in the composer queue, and we'll figure out. You know, yeah, if I there is been, one, then I sorry if I missed it. <laughs> I haven't been looking for a while. Uh, uh, we had this problem like three months ago. I'll revisit that and I'll ping you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We can. Uh, it sounds like an issue with like including themes. Yeah, it, it could be because we're not testing themes currently, yeah. so it might be that. Um, just in general, could you like say which distribution you represent? I think that would be interesting for all of us. No, this is not a distribution. This, oh. this is just um, an AMP module, oh, okay, Google AMP, and it has an AMP theme. So we are trying to enable the theme, but we can't. We couldn't. I don't know if it's possible now. We couldn't because it doesn't check out the, the theme and put in the themes folder when it builds it. it the dependency is there. Ah, right, right. I don't think I, I, I don't think Drupal CI is actually. Uh, Set up to understand that it is a theme. Yeah, yeah, it, that's, that's not, it's not the actual theme problems. I well, it could be that it doesn't understand yeah. the theme, but it could be when I looked, I think it was like couldn't check out the dependencies at all. That was the thing. Mm. Yeah, we, I'm gonna revisit and now I'll ping you directly. Yeah, and since I'm here, um, I want to ask you something, which is being like always a problem on Drupal CI, and many people got tricked into this problem, which is the um, uh, clean URLs. They are disabled by default. And sometimes we write tests and they go like, oh, I'm going to this URL and I'm testing this and that. And it all works fine on my local machine. And then they send the patch and it fails and it's really hard to debug fine. And I ended up doing like some crazy things to get the, the output on the screen. And then I discovered that the clean URLs are not enabled by default. And I was just wondering if you could do that. Um, I think if we enable clean URLs by default, then uh, people might write code that expects them to be. And that it's supposed to work with and without clean URLs. But so. when you do install this standard profile on your, your local machine, is enabled by default. Okay. So that would be like same thing, like. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, Drupal CI just does what run tests does. So it's that's actually probably something in Drupal core that needs to be enabled by default. If, if it's not, uh, it's well, not a configuration uh, on the testing. I know uh, probably there is some something somewhere that is not configured. Well, we can talk about this as yeah. well um, another time. Yeah. Cool. Verbal issue key. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm. I maintain the agov distribution and um, the version 7 like we tried to maintain the upgrade path and um, look, we just got so many so many issues with people who had changed you know like content types or whatever they changed and so like that, that became impossible to maintain so um, we did, redid it in Drupal 8 and basically said oh, it's going to be a, a starter kit because we're not going to maintain an upgrade path for it so let's just Answer to that, and the other thing with um, with B hat, I mean, you know, I think you you know you can you don't B hat. I think is probably not read by end users as much as you think it is. Like you kind of think that you're writing tests for people that you know the the end user is going to read. I think you should, um, my view, I think you should be focusing on tests that developers can read, and and you know the the issues of like I think you can. I mean. Sam might know, but you can you can run like a browser test base on like a, a, an installed site. So, or yeah, there is a patch in the queue and which is two seven nine three four four five, and there's a thunder uh, thunder. Uh, yeah, you can talk about the thunder solution uh, here. Yeah, I I already mentioned. Yeah, um, yeah before we are uh, testing, we are dumping. So we are, we do a clean install of the distribution, and then we are dumping. This installation and pulling this um, into the into the test class. So we extend the uh, the JavaScript test class, the functional JavaScript test class, <coughs> with the Thunder base class, and then in that we are pulling these uh, overriding the um, do install method or something like that, and pulling the um, yeah dump into the test. I'm actually really happy you mentioned that thing about updating configuration because that's the next thing we wanted to go into, and that's a big deal. 
Yeah, see, next slide. Beautiful. So yeah, uh, the issues with configuration are exactly what you said. You install the config, you install it once, or from default config, you install it, and then the site owns it. You can now no longer rely on the state of config. You know? Um, so what do you do with updating a distro, which is, or keeping it up to date, because they're heavily based on config? Um, there's different solutions to this. I don't know if any one solution is right. What we just came up with in Lightning normally, we've just been documenting it. We've been, like, things that we can't, we try to update everything we can automatically, but stuff that we just can't be sure that the user doesn't want to change it. And even if it's, like, the smallest little Boolean thing, like, in some, de you know, nestled in some view somewhere, um, we just, we document it. We're like, well, if you want to do this thing, go to this admin screen, you know, this page, click on this, and set it to that and then hit save. Um, we introduced recently uh, like just a command line uh, thing to run those particular types of things automatically, prompting the user for each one. Um, and then I think you have a different way in Thunder. Yeah, a little bit. Um, what we are doing, we are documenting everything as well, but we are documenting it in, uh, in Drupal. So in the UI, we are using um, the checklist API module um, to create a a bullet point for every update um, we do, and then we are um, um, creating uh, some YAML files, and the YAML files contains um, expected configurations, so this is what we expect, what the configuration should be on the uh, user side, um, so the state that we shipped, more or less, and another uh, point for um, new configuration. So before update will happen, we check, okay, if is, is this expected configuration? If yes, then we apply our new configuration, and if not, then um, we will not mark the bullet point in the UI, so the user gets then notification, okay, there were some updates we couldn't apply, then follow these steps to apply by yourself, or just uh, uh, mark it, and then you can skip the, the update. So that's the solution we had. Um, something people has to have discussed in a while, for a while now is uh, to flip the thing around and like don't allow to edit anything uh, unless you opt in into special things. So like the distribution could explicitly say these are the things you can change, like the site name, and that's it. <laughs> And the logo is not allowed to be changed, or something like that. Um, it's like a really radical approach, um, and it would require a lot of communication because there are probably use cases to change m much more than you actually expect. Um, but at least that way, you could like probably provide an update path uh, in the most safe way you can think of. It's like so, this is sorry. Go ahead. So we are planning to build like a distribution Drupal 8, and we have the same problem. And what you're thinking also is to use um, config filter um, plugins that would be like filter the configuration when it's exported and uh, would, lock, would lock only some part of configuration. And, this, and this, um, this, what is locked is not configuration, it's, it's an actual code. So it's in the, in the module, so it's like a, a class, it's a config filter class that would just handle these kind of things. And this paired with um, some UI tweaks would at least uh, secure a part of the site, right? And then I like really a lot your, your approach, which is that you, you compare what the, the, the configuration should be for the update to, to work, and then if you cannot apply the update, then, then, you, then you mark it. Yes. That's nice. Exactly. I think these two approach would kind of cover like 80% of the mess that we have to deal with, probably. I don't know. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, I'm just curious, like if you were going to uh, manipulate a view or add a field to something in, in from one version to the next, could you use the API to do that and have have something that's using Drupal's REST API to do that as part of the upgrade path so that instead of it being like you ship with config that has changed, you ship with a script that manipulates the API v to make the changes? Is that, is that something that could be possible? Wait, how does the API come into this? Uh, can you use Drupal's API to manipulate a view? Uh, that's how I usually do it, um, like in the sense of like... Like, I mean, you're using the UI to manipulate a view, or... Or like, you know, I load the view and I like figure out where things are, like, and then I decode the gigantic frickin', you know, shoot me in the face array. Right, but uh, I mean, is there, is there a, a um, like a REST API to modifying a view? 
using the REST API to not that I know kind of make a replay script to modify the config. I mean, that's how I did that, but without using REST. Okay. Yeah, oh, just, just ran just okay. normal PHP. So. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. So you're not you're not shipping config with just a new con you know you modify a view and you've added new fields. You're not just exporting that new. No. No. We're like we're we're actually like writing code that just like goes and updates. Really does just low level changes. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, but you also export the configuration again, right? For like new installations yes. of, yeah, of the of yes. the profile. Yes, of course. Yeah. Not. So you need both. Yeah, so this but, is something I would be yeah. curious so, people. So the next want. problem is like uh, semantic versioning. So um, if you have any kind of config module uh, dependencies, um, like it's really hard to like follow their updates because they might not follow semantic versioning, which means that they might break something in the patch release. And you have, and then like in another patch release, they have a security update and then you need to follow this. Um, so um, yeah, that's a, that's a huge problem. I think um, it's mostly mostly a social issue that like um, module authors are not like don't follow uh, don't want to follow semantic versioning even if it's actually like the right way to do it. I think technical solutions don't really help here. Do, do modules have patch no, modules don't have patch versions no. yet. But in the way that we treat the module versions in Composer, they end up being major minor. Yeah. So, but there isn't yet been a, a cultural shift to tell people that like in the major version, this is where you do backwards compatible breaking changes and in the minor version, this is where you do new features. And so by, I think if we add the patch version onto Drupal.org, that's the time when we can also like communicate the cultural shift of like, here, here's how you should use it. There, there, is, there is a plan. The, uh, right, <laughs> fact, the, uh, yeah, the, <laughs> Change and, and it's right. minor change, but that's, I, mean, I think people would be still scared to put out the new major release for breaking changes because they should, oh, be, yeah. they should, should be. but I mean, they, right, but like people will then, then still like try to sneak in like breaking changes in minor versions. So it's for me, it's a cultural problem. Yeah. And um, the introducing semantic versioning into contrib in on Drupal.org, that was the issue that started the genesis of we need a composer facade. So then, you know, we got sidetracked and built that. <laughs> so now, now that we have that, Thanks. now, now, the, now it's, uh, it's kind of a plausible thing to get accomplished. It's just, there's a lot of code that touches versions and uh, e there's, there's an issue in Drupal core that it doesn't handle semantic versioning properly. So um, we should fix that too before we can do it on Drupal.org. Yeah, I tend to agree with Daniel. It's a cultural issue. I mean, like right now, it fits, it's right now it's the jungle. You know, like will version you know one point one be the same module from one point two? I mean, most likely yes. But you know, I have made that mistake before. Where like this version and then the next minor version were pretty much completely different. And guess what? I got a lot of complaints about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think like at the very like Semver doesn't prevent people from doing that kind of thing, but it at least puts in guidelines so it makes you look like a jerk if you <laughs> break people's stuff, um, which kind of is a jerk thing to do anyway when you have rules against that, so. Yeah, don't break the rules. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, another pain point. <laughs> now back to install broke. That, yeah, <laughs> um, is that uh, like, that's more low level on the Drupal core side of things is that installation profiles are both modules and they are modules at the same time. Um, which is really weird, which causes all kind of edge cases you can't even imagine. Um, <laughs> especially like if you like install a module and then like in your install hook, do you have the modules available or the install profile? It's like all kind of crap. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know a solution for that. Personally, I think like an installation profile should not um, change anything on one time. And if you need to change anything on one time, you should put it into a module, um, but yeah, that's my yeah. opinion. My feeling is even more ex is more extremist in the sense that I'm wondering, like install profiles, um, as we mentioned, I think in some slide before, um, are loaded. They're pers they persist after you install. Um, they're loaded like regular modules with all regular modules by the module handler. They're treated as modules. You can say get module, you know, standard, and it'll work. Um, 
which to me seems kind of crazy. I'm like, why does my Drupal site care which install profile I use? Because install profiles, I mean, to me, their purpose is mostly to deliver default config um, and possibly change the installer in some ways, you know, add, add steps to it and maybe modify certain steps. And that's it. Like, you're not, as Daniel said, you're not supposed to put hooks into them. You're not supposed to put services into them. Uh, Lightning breaks this rule massively, but you're not supposed to put like update hooks into them and stuff like that. Um, but I'm just wondering why, I don't even know why they're persistent. I don't understand why the Drupal site cares what the install profile was. I got my default config installed, so what, you know? Hmm? And not as a module, but to, to know which modules to load. Yeah, but then once it's done, you know? And then the modules that are, that are installed are stored in core.extension, I think. I th well, the, the, there are modules in the profiles folder. Yeah. Oh, the modules in the profiles folder. Drupal yeah. needs to know where to look to find modules, so. Yeah, but and I never yeah. understand why, because why can't Composer solve the same problem? Yeah. Can you please go to the mic? Thank you. <laughs> so now we find ourselves at the intersection of I many mean, problems. It's true, like, but that, that's a, just a packaging issue. I mean, once you have Composer, you don't need to put them all inside the profile anymore. I mean, just the profile really becomes just something that you, you really need to adjust the installation, then right. it gets out of the way. We, yeah. for, our, for our stuff, we, we actually think we are doing like a, a like a known profile, like there is because Re Drupal requires it, but it's an empty profile and just uh, proxies everything to a core module and that one will do everything because we will install it anyway by command line, so we don't need screens or UI things. Yeah. And uh, we find it very convenient because this removes one layer of dependencies, right? So because the semantic versions can be only on the modules and not on the profile, so we get the profile really out of our way, which is very beneficial for dependencies management yeah. because the semantic versioning, we just care about the semantic versioning of the modules of your distribution and not yeah. any more than one of the profile. Yeah. See? Can Klausi, I Sorry, you mentioned that. Is there a use case which, where a composer wouldn't solve the problem? Uh, what do you mean? But I, oh. I guess it's fine. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, yeah. great feedback. Yeah. I, I just wanted to uh, compare the issue of is it really an install profile or a profile where my use case and I know others have the same use case is not about installing a site and then going off and, and configuring it. It's profiles are also a way of maintaining hundreds of sites that you want to have a, a standard install across all of those sites and keep them maintained together and have the updates so we can uh, we can have our install profile or distribution and profile that says these are the configurations and these are the standard configurations and when we roll out version two, it's going to update all of these things across the profile across 500 sites that are all running the same profile. So it's not just, and they won't have done any configuration. In fact, they might be exactly as described. All they've done is change their title, their logo, and everything else will stay the same across all the sites. So there is a use case for uh, profiles to have updates and all of that part of it as well and be treated like a module. Otherwise, we just end up with a, a module that replicates everything that would have otherwise just been in the profile. Yeah, that's kind of how I looked at it um, initially too. Um, and that's why Lightning is, Lightning's install profile is uh, loaded with you know update hooks and all kinds of stuff. And not just update hooks, I think it even has a services YAML and like has very small APIs in it. So it's everything I said not to, that you know I don't think is a good idea, I did. Um, but yeah, it's just like, I guess for me it's just like it's, I feel like there's kind of a scoping issue with profiles, with install profiles in a lot of ways. Like I'm not really sure what their, I'm not 100% sure what their job is, you know? Like so if it's gonna be that kind of thing that you just said, then like okay. But if it's, if it's gonna be like a smaller scope thing where it's just like, well this is just my default config and the way I wanna set it up at install time, then okay, but I think we have to choose, you know? There is a difference there. Yeah, I can totally yeah, see that. So, so one of the problems with this is, is that you can uninstall modules that the profile depends on. So if, if you have services that depend on the modules that it ships and expect them to be there, you can't. So, but if, if you build your, your distribution or, or your install profile that is just going to be installed everywhere the same way and you, you can have services and all, all sorts of stuff and you know that these are like always installed and the modules are there, then there, there's really not much of a big difference and, and then they're the same, except they're not. <laughs> but you treat them the same way, essentially. Like, the, you, you, you have them as update hooks, but you could also just have no profile and have a profile module that does the same. Yeah. So it's, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, which sounds like a scoping issue to yeah. me. So, yeah. Yeah, talking about the neck, it's really related to the discussion <laughs> about profile, insert profile yeah. inheritance. So, um, there's like, this patch. There are a lot of people <laughs> building stuff upon, like, for example, Lightning. So they build a distribution based upon Lightning. And then the question is, how do you, like, we use everything which is coming from Lightning. Maybe your agency, like, wants to have a starting kit based upon Lightning or something like that. And, um, yeah, that's, that's a tough problem. There is a core issue for that, which... Yeah. It's like at 400 comments, and we, at this point, Lightning, the Lightning team, we bring in this patch, um, but we know it's never going to get committed. So, yeah. um, and probably it's just as well too, because you know this is a compositing issue. Yeah. This is about being able to. Yeah. So, so what it's doing, it does, it does basically introduce the idea of having multiple active installation profiles, which change the behavior of your site, <laughs> and you can install some of them, uh, uninstall like modules and. So like it's the same problem what we already have but just worse. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm not really convinced that this is the right solution. I, I think a better solution would be to have some kind of way of composing things. Yeah. Um, so the the level of composability should be a module from my point of view. So if you have some kind of media thing, then you have your Lightning Media module. Yeah. And then in your install install profile, you pick the things you need. Either yeah. from the other, from the other um, installation profile, or for your current installation <laughs> profile, yeah. which means that like um, module uh, installation profiles like Lightning potentially has have to like put out more modules instead of just installation profile yeah. using a subtree split or something. Like yeah, that. we'd have to split it apart, which I'm I'm personally been in favor uh, of. But um, and and then it just comes to um, like picking the things you want. Um, which maybe even make makes updates a little bit easier. Yeah, because I mean, you also have semantic versioning on the individual module level, so you can like not update the media stuff, but update the workflow stuff yeah. or something like that. I kind of think um, Composer is the key to this, honestly, and having everything be Composer based. Because part of the problem right now, I feel with this, is consider Lightning Media, right? It's a, you know, it's it's a part of Lightning. It's a fairly it can operate independent of the other components of Lightning. Um, but it has like, I don't know how many dependencies, a bunch. And there's no way we could put a module page up that was like, so you can download this module, but I also need to download, need you to download these other 10 modules and any dependencies they have as well, plus any JavaScript libraries they might want, and blah, blah, you would never do it, and you would be right not to. Um, so to me, if you know we had Composer up there dealing with all this dependency stuff, then that becomes composable. It's just like require lightning media and it's gonna get everything. So to me, um, you know, I'm I'm not like huge on the sub profile patch for precisely these reasons that it introduces a lot of complexity and that, you know, modules um, should be, I think, the smallest unit of composition. Um, but how, that depends on the you, resolution. How uh, would you ship with some predefined config for something like that if you wanted to have like just the, the media part? Predefined config in lightning? Just the oh. media. Like, like, say you wanted to define a couple of content types that come with, like, a media bundle. So I have a site, and I want to add media functionality, and I wanted to add just, it's almost like a distribution of just a small piece of it. Would that be possible? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, I would, it would just be like a module, right? Right, but yeah. where, where does the config go, the default config? Is that... Config install? Like, that's, that's where yeah. I would put it. Um, it's kind of easy to talk about, like, uh, like additional features, like, or, like scope features like media or something, but it becomes hard when we talk about like, you want to change something from an existing installation profile. Um, like the core extension.yaml is the perfect example. It's just one file to define all the modules you want to install. But um, like, um, like if you pick that module that have might have other dependencies, then you need to like merge them together. Or if you want to disable a feature, um, that's really hard, and I think it's un an, a totally unsolved problem. Yeah, um, our problem actually, like our use of this thing, came into existence because people were like, "Well, how do I turn off parts of Lightning?" And we're like, "Uh, like at install time, we mean," um, and like we were just like, "Uh, we don't know," and you know, so we ended up with this sub profile patch because the reason, the the thing about it is that it lets you exclude um, dependencies of the parent profiles. Um, so it's a way of blacklisting it. And then, you know, an InfoSec guy I know 
told me that it's always better to whitelist than to blacklist. So it's better to composite things together and say what you do want rather than be like, well, here comes the tidal wave of modules. Let me just black out the ones I don't want. Um, so yeah, basically. I guess I'm saying, that's a long way of saying yeah. I agree. And I, yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to talk about the um, situation we had, which is related to all this. Um, we have a distribution, and we use that for certain types of websites. And then we start to build some car websites still using that same distribution. So we had a situation when the distribution enables lots of things by default, and then we had to disable many of these things that came with it. So we're like, oh, we, this is not, not, not right. We need to split this thing. So what we came up with is making stuff, instead of like one distribution made like mini suites. So we have like SEO suites, we have advertising suites, uh, car suites. So when you enable that, it comes with a bunch of modules just related to each other. Yeah, one solution maybe uh, to this update path, there's a module called config actions, which allows you to define in YAML a way to update existing YAML files. Um, so like this are all bits I want to add. Um, I haven't used it, but it's out there from the form of features people. It's not just about YAML, yeah. it's about the actual checking out the module that you don't need. Mm. For example, for um, one of the car sites, we didn't need advertising, so we had all these DSP modules on the site that you like, didn't want it. Uh, so I want to uh, yeah, agree on the uh, whitelisting and blacklisting, and um, but I'm working with uh, this patch on how to use it. So talk about 500 sites, but actually they're split up into uh, five types of sites, each with a distribution, and I want to have a way of having those distributions inherit from a global company-wide distribution that sets certain things. Like we've got our password policy, and that I need to know that that is on every site, and I've got a way of ensuring it's there, installed, yeah. and that config, and I can report that every site has that set on it. But and that's where this comes in useful in that they can all be based off that one distribution that's very small and lightweight, but adds a few things, and then we can inherit from that and take our uh, brand-based distribution, say, that uh, builds everything else around that site, the content types and the theme and the look and feel of it, but just pulls in and inherits a certain set of things, um, but is controlled in a way that we can in a, in, uh, in a profile make sure it's there and yeah the whole thing that I don't want them to be able to disable it install and and blacklist and say I don't want the password policy it needs to be there we want to make sure it's always installed and yeah. on every site but that is totally solvable by expressing it inside the module dependency tree you could have a core module or something it, like it, that yeah it is, Which, it is yeah. possible that we could but it's like yeah we could have some use it doing module dependencies rather than profile dependencies. yeah yeah, I mean, profile dependencies as, and correct me if I'm wrong on this one, maybe I am, um, but I mean, when you list a dependency in a profile info, is it actually treated as a hard dependency? Because in my experience, you can uninstall them. All right, I don't know, like opinion seems to vary on this, because I've seen it, I've seen them be uninstallable and other people haven't, and I don't even know, but yeah. Yeah, it also depends whether it's uninstallable from the UI or the API. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, like the entire extension slash module subsystem is in a... Yeah, that's true. <coughs> so you can use a... State. It's actually a good point. It's inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is inconsistent. You can do a lot in the API that you can't do yeah. in the UI. So. Yeah, that's why we really try to, like, not I increase the scope of the, like, install profile by using this patch even more because it's already a mess and uh, it will just get worse. But you can't uninstall uh, no. Okay. It might make sense to, 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 to try to logically split up what's currently considered the install profile into a module bit and an actual install profile, which does add installation time and does nothing afterwards. Yeah. yeah. We ultimately did that in Lightning. Like at the, in the beginning, there was so much more code in the Lightning profile itself that was doing all kinds of stuff. We had hook form alters in there. Like. <laughs> Um, and eventually we, we did exactly that. We split off a lot of that stuff into a module called Lightning Core, and every core, every Lightning component depends on that, um, which effectively makes it a required module, but exactly for that reason, or just yeah, like... Uh, no we did exactly the same thing. We're maintaining the OpenFed mod, uh, distribution, which, uh, so uh, what we decided for our Drupal 8 version was that we have 
basically a, an upgrade module. Okay. And we handle anything for, for things like upgrades, we handle in code in that module rather than through the installation profile. Yeah. Just to avoid that, that well, schizophrenia almost of, of having the installation profile do stuff on an already installed site, which yeah. really it shouldn't. Yeah, I agree. And to keep things siloed nicely too. Because we have this major rule that we don't want any custom code. We, we try to be very, very strict in that. And mm -hmm. the only exception that we allow, well, right now because the ecosystem wasn't quite there yet, we have some more exceptions, but the only real exception that we allow is, well, the install, the upgrade module, there we can do some custom code, but, the, but it can only be run at install or update time. Mm -hmm. We don't want anything running in there during normal operation of a site. Right. No, no hooks that, that mod, no alter hooks, only uh, update hooks and things like that. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not always easy. <laughs> Nothing about distros when they become big enough is easy. So we had this kind of set up so that I, uh, I was going to talk about all the things Drupal.org could do to help distributions. Um, you know, of course, there's stuff in core, but um, mainly from a high level, there's you know what we talked about before, adding composer build steps to uh, packaging and distribution. And um, in addition to that, clarifying and improving our licensing policy. Like we've, there's been a kind of a ongoing conflict with what we have on Drupal.org for licensing and um, allowing for certain, because once you have a distribution and you have a whole bunch of things packaged together and a lot of third party and extra libraries so that you have a finished product that you want people to be able to use, Sometimes that puts you into the realm of it's only GPL v3 and not v2, which means we can't host it according to our current policy. And so those sorts of things are, if we can get that clarified and get that relaxed a little bit, then we might be able to host more uh, complete finished products that don't require end users to be forced to go download additional things to get a complete distribution. Um, the testing that we talked about earlier, uh, BDD testing, uh, enable testing in general on distributions. Right now we don't have a configuration screen or anything. I mean, it would, um, we would need to do that to enable, uh, and, and figure out, you know, if there are BDD tests, what does the output look like when you go to Drupal.org to look at your results? Like, where, where do you see that? Um, there's some things that we've been doing to promote and enhance the discovery distributions. I'm not sure if you guys have looked at the industry pages that we've put on the front. There's the industry vertical pages. Um, there's healthcare and there's, um, uh, education and government and publishing and on those pages we've been putting feature distributions so like if there's a distribution that tackles a particular industry which is one of the things that we're hoping that distributions can become is a you know are you a are you putting together a sports team well here use the sports team distribution or are you building a farm then use the farm distribution and here's a here's a package solution that is more than just a bunch of Lego bricks that can build anything and more of like here's some solved problems for you to put it on. So we're featuring those when, when they get polished enough to be featured, then we're putting those on the front page. Um, we could probably do more on, you know, just the, just the UI and UX of browsing distributions and figuring out which ones people need. So along the same lines as, you know, we're improving our project pages. Um, and then of course, semantic versioning for contrib is an issue that we should tackle, so. Um, I have a bunch more slides, but I'm not going to talk about it. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, does anyone else have some kind of ideas, problems, suggestions? Uh, yeah. Random questions. Free beers. Six o'clock, guys. <laughs> I was just thinking um, the distributions are already on GitHub and using Travis, so, I, so it feels like we are duplicating stuff when we do the same infrastructure on Drupal.org, right? Also, the same uh, applies to assembling distributions. You can also do that in Travis CI, where you can say, um, run NPM, run Composer, then publish the tarball to location X, Y, Z, and you're basically done. Yeah. And I just replicate and all of that to Drupal.org, it feels like just a really, really lot of work. And if distributions are elsewhere already, then we should really take a hard look at that if you really need to do that. And more um, improving the integration on Drupal.org to linking external tarballs and hiding releases on, on distribution pages really make that page yeah. nice 
So more like investing in, in the color, the paint that we put on Drupal.org instead of doing the hard work in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Klausi, for <laughs> covering that. Because uh, what I wanted to say kind of like really builds on top of this. Um, because the, the composer stuff, I, I love composer and everything. But um, it was the first slide that you showed with, with address modules and so on. So if, if we have a tarball for, for distributions, uh, it suggests to users that they can just use that. Um, but if you add uh, address to Lightning, I, I don't know if Lightning... Can it doesn't have address, but it has two modules that... Uh, no, one but, of, but you know, if, if, you know. if also, uh, address is not in Lightning, so yeah. if I download uh, Lightning and it's packaged and it has everything and, and so on, and I add address to it, which also has a download thing, it will not work. And, right. and as an end user, that's really confusing. And yeah. there's not really a good way that I know that we can solve this about, apart from like the Composey IO yeah. thing. That yeah. there, there's yeah. also some really interesting uh, issue from Amatesco right now, which yeah. is using a FAR file. A really so uh, it's basically like, um, as an end user, you could add a new module on a on your Drupal page, which would then like upload the composer JSON file onto yeah. Drupal.org. Drupal.org would like package everything up, and you are allowed to download a single FAR file, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't have like all the file uh, system wide issues because you can, for example, add a signature to a FAR file. Yeah, and and the other thing. So I, I don't know if you want to re reply to this. Um, well, sort of. Um, just kind of one thing at a time because uh, yeah, I had a. Nice long meeting yesterday with Boyan and Dries and uh, Jess and some other folks about that problem specifically. And the consensus was we really need to improve the update manager and actually improve yeah. the update manager to be able to allow people to add the address module to their site and not make it so that they just download the tarball from Drupal.org and just add it, but, yeah, exactly. but that, that, they have a, that they have a path to be able to do that. And yeah, so, but so, so the thing is that the Drupal 7 way of doing things will not work in Drupal. No, it will not. So yeah. and, and the other thing I want to mention, um, I, I was working um, on making sites reinstallable from uh, existing configuration, and the, this, the profiles are like a huge pain point, especially with the dependencies and the fact that they're special paced but not completely, and only sometimes and so one of the solutions that uh, exists or, or is, is most likely to, to be added to core is, is um, uh, what was it called the install profile generator so you install your install installation profile but then you create a new installation profile for the exist for for the specific site and then you install that so like your profile is out, like the, the original profile is out of the way, but all the modules, the original profile shipped, um, are still there, and and are composed and everything. So, if if like all the update hooks and so on are, are in the module, then the distribution as such is just the initial one and to install, but then to reinstall and run run the site is not not being used. So, I I would be very happy if distributions like the the, the installation profile of distributions would be as small as possible and do as little as possible and delegate everything to modules that behave like modules. That behave like modules. <laughs> so David's going to... Yeah. Um, just a yeah, final slide. Um, there is a code sprint on Friday. Uh, it would be nice if everyone would come. There are probably people working on installation profiles on their own. Um, in case someone is really, like, motivated, they could like update the in installation profile inheritance issue and saying uh, like this entire room agreed that we don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, feel free. I'd cause some really cool That's drama. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, you instantly with just thumbs down on emojis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why we have emojis. We have emojis uh, now. Yeah, exactly. I'm yeah. going to have a really fun discussion with the other guy on the Lightning team, actually, when I get back to Boston about yeah. that. That's going to be an interesting one. Too bad for you. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be quite the argument, but uh, we'll live. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys.
Usually, like, if it's a mandatory, I mean, uh, so it has happened where, like, the manual upgrades are going to be mandatory, and that's, but that's always things, like, we're removing.